Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone to the fourth meeting of the Public Utility Commission for calendar year 2015 and ask that you join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The uh, first item on this morning's agenda is the approval of the minutes of the January 29th public meeting. It's a pleasure to recognize Vice Chairman Coleman as editor of the minutes. Vice Chairman Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have reviewed the minutes of the January 29th, 2015 public meeting and move that they be approved as submitted. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the uh, minutes are approved as submitted here this morning, and it's a pleasure to welcome to the podium to commence with our public meeting agenda items, Ms. Cheryl Walker Davis. Cheryl, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. May I please this honorable commission on behalf of your various offices and bureaus, we present for your consideration and disposition the following agenda items, commencing this morning with matters on behalf of the Bureau of Audits on page one. It is recommended that the commission adopt the recommendation to release the audit report with regard to the UGI Utilities Inc. Gas Utility Division's Low Income Self-Help Program. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. With regard to matters on behalf of the Office of Special Assistance commencing on page two, with regard to the first item, it is recommended that the commission adopt the staff recommendation in the proceeding involving the Pico Energy Company uh, petition for approval of default service program for the period of June 1st, uh, 2015 through May 31st of 2017 and the, uh, the petition for reconsideration in, involving that case. Noting, so, noting the statement of Commissioner Brown. Thank you, so moved. Second. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Brown for purposes of her statement. Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before the Commission for Consideration and Disposition is the petition for reconsideration of Pico Energy Company's default service program filed by the Office of Small Business Advocate on December 19, 2014. The program was approved by Commission order entered on December 4th, 2014 at the instant docket. The issue at center of the OSBA petition concerns the approved program's expansion of hourly price default service from all customers with greater than 500 kilowatt demand to all customers with greater than 100 kilowatt demand. OSBA posits that the commission permitted this expansion in order to maintain consistency with the commission's retail market investigation order. They submit that achieving consistency with the end state order is not the appropriate objective, but rather that achieving consistency with the relevant statutory requirements is. OSBA touches on an issue that I am particularly sensitive to, and therefore I will make my position on this matter clear. The OSBA is correct that achieving consistency with the relevant statutory requirements is the paramount objective when reviewing this case. Indeed, as the OSBA submits, the end state order is merely advisory and does not trump statutory law. Nonetheless, I conclude from my review of this proceeding that PICO is indeed compliant with the prudent mix standard found at 66 PACS section 2807E of the Public Utility Code. I believe this section of the code does not require a default service provider to procure a prudent mix from each specific customer class but rather that the entire program is aggregate to include a pr prudent mix of products as specified. PICO's program includes spot market products in the residential, medium commercial, and large commercial and industrial po portfolio, short-term contracts in the residential and small commercial portfolio, and long-term contracts in the residential, medium commercial, and large commercial portfolio. Therefore, I agree with the staff recommendation to dismiss this petition for reconsideration, as in my opinion, no, review, no new or novel arguments have been offered by OSBA. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Is there any further discussion? Any objections? Hearing on the motion passes unanimously, noting Commissioner Brown's statement. In omnibus fashion, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the remaining recommendations on the part of the Office of Special Assistance, commencing with the recommendation at the bottom of page two in the proceeding involving the complaint of the Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement versus Paul Mark Peachy, T.A. Peachy Enterprises, and continuing with all items appearing on pages three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight, and nine through and including the recommendation in the proceeding involving the application of Star Limousine Service, Inc. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. On behalf of the Bureau of Technical Utility Services, again in omnibus fashion, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the staff recommendations commencing with the recommendation at the top of page 10 in the proceeding involving the application of PennDOT pertaining to a bridge replacement project in Pattonboro, Cambria County, and continuing with the recommendations on pages 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, then concluding with the recommendation pertaining to the Registration of the security certificate involving People's Natural Gas Company, LLC. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. On behalf of the Law Bureau, on page 16 of the public meeting agenda, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the recommendation uh, to adopt a proposed tentative order in the proceeding involving Go Solo Transport, Inc. I'm so sorry, Go Solo Technologies, Inc. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. And on behalf of the Office of Administrative Law Judge, it is recommended that the Commission adopt uh, ALJ Barnes's recommended decision at the top of page 17 in the general rate increase proceeding involving the Borough of Hanover, Hanover Municipal Water Works. And it should be noted that the second item has been postponed until the next public meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. With regard to the remaining item on page 17 in the proceeding involving the complaint of Hasim S. Hashi versus Philadelphia Gas Works and ALJ Heap's initial decision therein, there is the motion of Commissioner Brown. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Brown for purposes of our motion. Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On August 20th, 2014, Mr. Hashi filed a formal complaint with the Commission seeking a payment arrangement. This case was dismissed with prejudice due to the complainant's failure to timely appear at the hearing. The decision to dismiss this case raises some questions of due process because of the fact that the complainant had filed an identical, identical complaint against PGW a month after the incident complaint was filed. On October 20th, 2014, PGW filed a motion to consolidate the two matters, noting that they involved the same parties and revolve around identical factual events concerning billing and payment for gas service at Mr. Hashi's service address. The motion to consolidate is still pending and it has not, as of this date, been acted upon. Because the motion to consolidate was not acted upon, the first complaint was dismissed with prejudice. However, the second identical complaint was settled amicably. In the interest of procedural and legal clarity, I do not wish that the record reflect that the two contradictory commission decisions were rendered on what is essentially the same proceeding. Therefore, I move to consolidate the two cases and clarify that the certificate of satisf satisfaction should apply to both dockets. As such, the identical decision dismissing the first complaint with prejudice should be rendered moot. Therefore, I move that the Office of Special Assistance prepare an order, opinion and order consistent with this motion. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Mr. Chairman, I would note for clarity of the record that the item that was postponed on that page pertains to the proceeding involving PPL Interstate Energy Company and PPL Electric Utilities Corporation. That concludes the presentation of regular agenda items. Turning now to the cases of special interest on the carry-in agenda and the proceeding involving the joint petition of Verizon Pennsylvania LLC and Verizon North LLC for competitive classification of all retail services in certain geographic areas and for a waiver of regulations for competitive services. There is the joint motion, Mr. Chairman, that you have with Vice Chairman Coleman, as well as the statements of Commissioners Whitmer, Brown, and Cawley. These are individual statements, as well as your own statement, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Vice Chairman Coleman for purposes of our joint motion here this morning. Vice Chairman Coleman. Well, thank you, Chairman. Um, this is a fairly complex uh, proceeding before the commission this morning. And before we get into the motion, I just wanted to take a quick minute to thank a number of the parties that have been involved in this proceeding. Uh, first, with our administrative law judge, Cheskis, for the work that he has done in developing the record evidence here and handling any of the, the debates and disputes. So uh, Judge Rainey, we wanted to uh, thank him for his effort. 
Uh, I also wanted to, uh, to thank uh, Norman Kennard from the chairman's office, uh, working with Matt to team <coughs> in the office. Matt uh, served as the quarterback on this matter, uh, working in tandem with Norm, and uh, in my view, have done a, uh, a spectacular job uh, with this proceeding. Uh, I'll spare you this morning of reading our joint motion, which uh, is 35 pages in length, uh, but what I would like to do is to instead focus on the summary, which I believe is really at the heart of what we are accomplishing this morning in uh, leveling the playing field for not only Verizon, but for also anybody else who is operating in those various wire centers. So uh, I ask that you bear with me this morning. It's a fairly lengthy summary, but I think it's important to get at the, uh, the facts of the matter. Uh, I would also ask that this joint motion in its entirety, the 35 pages, be entered into the record as though we had read it in its entirety. In this proceeding, Verizon filed with the Commission a joint petition pursuant to Section 3016A of the Public Utility Code seeking to declare as competitive all protective all protected in non-competitive retail services offered by Verizon within certain areas of their Philadelphia, Erie, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, Harrisburg, Pittsburgh, Allentown, and York service regions. Essentially, Verizon seeks, to, seeks a determination that the basic local exchange service is competitive in 194 wire centers in Pennsylvania. Verizon in its petition also requests an 11-year waiver of all of Chapter 64 and parts of Chapter 63 of the Commission's regulations. Section 3016A of Chapter 30 permits the Commission, after review of all relevant evidence presented, to declare a protected service as competitive where an incumbent local exchange carrier has demonstrated the availability of like or substitute services or other business activities provided or offered by alternative service providers. Thus, the key inquiry for competitive determination purposes is whether, quote, like or substitute services to basic local exchange services are sufficiently available in the wire centers subject to the petition. We believe the overwhelming record evidence in the competing cable telephony and wireless voice service are like or substitute service to basic local exchange services. In determining what constitute a like substitute service, what matters most is whether the products are good substitutes for one another in the eyes of the buyer. In this case, the incontrovertible evidence shows that in the eyes of the consumers, the numerous competitive choices offered by cable and other wireless providers are like or substitute services for the incumbent local exchange carrier's basic local exchange service. Thus, regardless of any technological or economic differences that may exist between Verizon traditional basic service and the competing cable and wireless voice services, the bottom line is that consumers, are, consumers clearly view these competing services as adequate, adequate replacements for basic service. We also believe Verizon has demonstrated widespread availability of cable and wire, wireless voice service in 153 of 194 wire service centers subject to the petition. The record evidence shows that in these wire centers, at least 97% or more of the households have access to cable, while wireless voice service are ubiqu ubiquitously available. Therefore, we will classify as competitive 153 wire centers and will not classify as competitive 41 wire centers that appear in CWAIBEW's Table 2 of the main brief. Chapter 30 is clear that the primary impact of the competitive designation is twofold. Verizon may price a competitive service at its discretion as long as it is above cost and Verizon may maintain a price list of a competitive service rather than maintaining a commission-approved tariff. A competitive determination, however, does not equate to complete deregulation of the service, and I think it's important to emphasize that point this morning, that this is not a complete deregulation of Verizon services in these, in these particular competitive exchanges. Thus, with the exception of rate regulation and tariffing, the Commission's Title 66 authority remains over basic local exchange service in competitive wire centers, including over the ordering, installation, 
restoration and discontinuation of the services. Moreover, in accordance with Chapter 30, Verizon will be required to maintain at the Commission's price list for its deterred basic local exchange service in competitive wire centers. We are also granting Verizon's request to waive certain Chapter 63 and Chapter 64 regulations for, for applying in competitive wire centers. The waiver period for a period of five years pending data collection and rulemaking to address the stat the status of these chapters for non-competitive and competitive services on a permanent industry-wide basis. The waiver will also apply to competitive local exchange carriers operating in the 153 wire centers determined to be competitive. For starters, granting the waiver brings Verizon closer to regulatory parity with competing providers whose retail services are not subject to commission jurisdiction. Moreover, many of the regulations that, are we're that we are waiving this morning no longer make sense in the competitive environment. Here, the record clearly demonstrates that sufficient comp competition exists in the wire center subject to the petition. Where sufficient competition exists, we believe regulation is not needed and should, should be either reduced or even discontinued. Thus, we find that the burdens of complying with outdated regulation with which Verizon's competitors do not have to comply with is an unreasonable hardship that justifies granting the waiver of certain regulations. We note that our action on the waiver request is not intended to serve as an abandonment of our regulatory responsibilities. Rather, our action on the waiver is an attempt to streamline our reg regulation of Verizon's basic local exchange service to reflect the competitive environment that exists in the 153 wire centers contained in this joint motion. At the same time, we are maintaining certain customer protections that we believe are necessary to the transition basic local exchange service to the competitive service. These consumer protections include the following. Confirming that a competitive determination does not change Verizon's carrier of last resort or caller obligation in competitive wire centers. In essence, this will remain an obligation in the, the centers that we are de uh, declaring as competitive this morning. Second, confirming that Verizon's caller obligations includes maintaining a basic standalone telephone service offering to customers in competitive wire centers. Confirming that competitive determination does not impact Verizon's emergency 911 obligation in competitive wire centers. Confirming that competitive, determinations do, con, competitive determination does not alter Verizon's Chapter 30 plan commitments, including the provisions of ubiquitous broadband service. Ensuring that Verizon addresses certain customer, certain customer protection related issues in its product guide that will memorialize the rates, terms, and conditions of basic telephone service in competitive wire exchanges. Maintaining certain customer protections in chapter 63 and 64 of our regulations that remain relevant in a competitive telecommunication market, including regulations related to service outages and suspension and termination of service. And lastly, taking additional steps, including data collection and initiating a rulemaking to determine what service regulations should apply long-term in non-competitive and competitive wire centers. Today's decision is an important step toward modernizing how we regulate telecommunication in Pennsylvania. The telecommunication marketplace is a dynamic and fast-changing segment of both the Pennsylvania and national economies. As the record in this case shows, the communication options for today's consumer have expanded beyond traditional voice-only service offered by incumbent carriers to include a variety of new service options and providers. With the proliferation of service bundles and the rising popularity of both wireline and wireless providers offering competing products and services, consumers now have an array of options to meet their communication needs. We believe the Commission's regulations of basic local exchange service should reflect these market developments. Therefore, we move this morning that the Verizon Pennsylvania LLC and Verizon North LLC joint petition for competitive classification of all retail services in certain geographic areas is granted in part and denied in part consistent with this joint motion. Secondly, the Verizon Pennsylvania and Verizon North LLC joint petition for waiver of regulations 
for competitive services is granted in part and denied in part consistent with this joint motion. And lastly, that the Office of Special Assistance prepare an opinion and order consistent with this motion. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? We'll note objections here in a moment. We have a statement of Commissioner Whitmer. I'd like to recognize her this morning for purposes of her statement. Commissioner Whitmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like my statement entered into the record as if I had read it in its entirety. I support the action that the Commission is taking today to designate basic local exchange service as competitive in certain wire centers throughout Pennsylvania. It is no secret that I have been a strong proponent of competition and furthering competitive markets in our Commonwealth. Consistent with that position, I have strongly supported retail market competition in electric, natural gas, and transportation sectors. It's clear from the record evidence in this proceeding that there are competitive technologies available today that consumers have willingly adopted to meet their various communications needs. The pervasive, expanding, and innovative use of technology has revolutionized our way society communicates and how we use and view traditional landline service. At the same time that I am a strong proponent of competition, I have consistently advocated for consumer education and protections in the competitive markets. In my review of the record, as well as previous legislative efforts addressing competitive classification of certain telecommunication services, I have continuously advocated for appropriate levels of consumer protections. I support our action today because it maintains our statutory obligation under Section 1501 of the Code, which requires the Commission to ensure the maintenance of safe and adequate service without unreasonable interruptions or delays. In doing so, we continue to provide a forum for Pennsylvania consumers to file complaints before us on quality of service issues should they occur. As I have stated during proceedings involving other industries, it is entirely appropriate for the Commission to periodically review its regulations to determine whether or not they have kept pace with current industry standards and practices. Telecommunications is no different. Our action today provides an examination and waiver of certain regulations in the wire centers declared competitive in this proceeding. However, our obligations do not end with this proceeding. We must continue our review and revision of our telephone regulations to ensure our regulatory construct accurately reflects the changing telecommunications market. The Commission has struck a good balance today between removing impediments to competition and technological advances while maintaining important consumer protections. With that, however, I am ready to work with the General Assembly should the legislative branch determine further action is necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmer. Now I'd like to recognize Commissioner Brown for purposes of her statement. Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do want to uh, submit my entire statement for the record, but I do feel it's important to provide a summary to those here today. As you have heard, Verizon is asking the Commission to reclassify three of five protected services from uh, protected service to competitive service in 194 of the 504 wire centers where Verizon provides telecommunications to residential business customers and business customers in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. In my review of this petition, I found that any decision other than outright dismissal of Verizon's petition violates the Statutory Construction Act. The words of Section 3016 uh, are clear on the scope of this type of petition. This section is limited to a service territory or a particular geographic area, exchange or group of exchanges or density cells within its service territory. When words of a statute are clear and free from ambiguity, courts as well as the commission cannot engraft additional verbiage upon it to pursue its spirit. Precedent also holds that it is absurd and unreasonable to conclude that the legislature intended the same phrase to have two distinctive meanings in the same section of a statute. Verizon's reliance on terms such as wire centers instead of exchanges are not in the statute, is not what the statute proposes a distinctive meaning, and it, it is absurd and unreasonable. 
Verizon's reliance on FCC's report on FCC reports and decisions about cable voice and wireless voice is an legal error, a legal error because Verizon considers them evidence for the proposition that those voice services are alike or substitute for basic service. That is contradicted by FCC reports. The FCC local competition reports of June 2014 and October 2014 expressly state that the FCC rules require a broadband connection for interconnected VoIP, an additional service which makes VoIP different from and more expansive than basic service. The FCC also states that the wireless subscriber counts that Verizon sites repeatedly from these reports do not constitute or imply the extent to which wireline and wireless telephone services are demand substitutes. Verizon attempts to dismiss the FCC's ruling in the quest forbearance order that wireless is no substitute for wireline by claiming that the decision addressed wholesale competition, not retail basic service competition. Verizon failed to establish a prima facie case Verizon's prima facie case rests on multiple services other than basic service. This includes bundled cable service, where voice is not a standalone service, but is provided along with internet access or TV service or both. Wireless services, which is not a standalone voice because it typically includes features like internet access and data, Loss of access lines, number porting, where consumers keep their number, but the impact of return numbers back to Verizon was not examined. And texting, email, Skype, Vonage, Magic Jack, and over-the-top voice over internet protocol. None of these services are alike or substitute for basic service. They are less reliable and more costly because they generally require a consumer to pay more for the additional services, primarily broadband, for they need to, that they need to use for them. Verizon failed to meet its burden of proof under the code. As the proponent of a rule or order, the complainant in this proceeding bears the burden of proof pursuant to Section 332A of the code. A petitioner before this commission must rebut the evidence of the opposing party by a preponderance of the evidence. Verizon did not present more convincing evidence and failed to rebut the facts and evidence presented by the opposing parties, namely evidence regarding the lack of competition in service territories. Even if Verizon's claim were at least persuasive enough to rebut the opposing party's evidence, the commission still has to weigh the evidence of both parties to find facts and issue a decision. Commission decisions must be supported by substantial evidence. Verizon's evidentiary sources are not public and often contradict their own claim. The petition raises substantial concerns about how to reconcile competition when it does emerge with Verizon's universal service obligation to provide telecommunication service at affordable rates to all consumers as required by their carrier of last resort obligation and eligible telecommunication carrier designation and money under federal law to do that. Verizon is understandably motivated by the regulatory disparity between carriers like Verizon who have carrier of last resort requirements and universal service mandates that their competitors lack. This disparity has its roots in the fact that Verizon's cable and wireless competitors are not Title II common carrier telecommunication, telecommunication providers under state and federal law. Verizon's competitors can deny service with impunity, refuse to deploy facilities without accountability, impose selective and discriminatory rate and service preferences, ignore carrier of last resort or universal service, and never worry if that service is safe, adequate, reliable, and private. Verizon does not have that luxury. The Commission must address this regulatory and market disparity, but not based on a petition that fails to make a prima facie case and that is not supported by an evidentiary record. Today's decision does not challenge competitors to meet the standard under which Verizon provides standalone voice service. Instead, 
This decision lowers the standard, thereby allowing Verizon to ignore the public interest like its unregulated competitors. I would have preferred, preferred a more measured and deliberate approach, perhaps utilizing pro, uh, pilot programs to assess the impact that action under Section 3016 would have on the over 60% of Verizon customers that will be affected. This did not occur, and for that reason, I will be descending in, to say, in today's decision. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Brown. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Cauley for purposes of his statement. Commissioner Cauley. Thank you, Chairman. Today, the Commission visits upon unsuspecting and unprepared basic local calling service residential and small business customers, unrestrained market forces. I uh, would be the first to vote for this motion if Verizon had come anywhere near abiding by the standards of the Public Utility Code. Unfortunately, they did not begin to carry their burden of proof. For starters, they ignored the standard, uh, and my colleagues in the majority ignore the standard in the statute. The burden of proof is carried by providing wire center specific data, wire center by wire center. Instead, all Verizon provided was broad data, statistics, nothing on a wire center by wire center basis. You'll notice from the vice chairman's summary that the basis for denying uh, competitive reclassification in 41 of the wire centers was information that was given by one of the protestants, not by Verizon. And that protestant did it only as a backup position. Uh, the Communications Workers of America, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, urged the commission to deny this petition in its entirety for failure of Verizon to carry its burden of proof. They were right. And as a backup position, they said, but if you do grant the petition, uh, uh, there are only arguably 41 wire centers that would pass muster. So it wasn't Verizon who provided the statutorily required evidence. The evidence establishes that Verizon's basic calling service is distinct from wireless and cable service, and therefore, uh, wireless and cable uh, are, are, are different. People buy cable and they buy wireless services for their own attractiveness, their own features, their own, their own conveniences. Uh, they do not buy cable and wireless services as a substitute for basic calling service, which is a unique service that people somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to 200,000 subscribers in this commonwealth feel is all the service that they need. They don't need a cable bundle with voice service. They don't need a wireless service with data plans. And therefore, the like or substitute requirement uh, of the statute is also not met. The Commission today also abolishes consumer protection regulations that have been in place since the 1980s and have been improved upon and have proven their worth literally over decades. Those protections are now gone. We will no longer entertain uh, any complaints about Verizon's rates in the most populous areas of our commonwealth. And we have, by abolishing some regulations and not others, we are causing a great deal of confusion about what consumers can complain about, and if they do complain, what relief they can be given. 
This is going to cause a lot of public confusion. It's going to cause a lot of problems for our own Bureau, Bureau of Consumer Services to sort this out. I have testified uh, before the legislature uh, about Verizon's attempt to achieve what they achieved today by saying that no one really knows the level of telecommunications competition in this commonwealth except the carriers themselves. What we need is an independent study, or as Commissioner Brown has suggested, we at least need a trial or a pilot. But Verizon, in its legislative efforts, its failed legislative efforts in the last two legislative sessions to achieve what it achieves today, resisted any, any experiments at all that would have proven the actual level of service in the Commonwealth, let alone in the wire centers that it seeks deregulation. This rushed proceeding, a proceeding in which the parties were required to complete their efforts within 150 days, a deadline which Verizon refused up front to extend, did not provide the information about the true level of competition in Pennsylvania, and it certainly didn't provide uh, any evidence of the true level of competition in the wire center by wire center uh, as the statute requires. So, I think the people of Pennsylvania would have been a lot better served if the public had had input into uh, this request. They did not. Uh, the people of Pennsylvania would have been far better served to let our legislature sort this out because they are still studying it. We should not approve this petition. For these reasons, I ask that my entire 30-page dissent be placed in the record as if I had read all of it, and I respectfully but vigorously dissent. Thank you, Commissioner Cawley, and uh, before we call the vote, let me first take this opportunity to personally thank my colleagues and their key staff members who worked uh, tirelessly on this particular case here this morning. And I think it's fair to say we have struck a compromise that is clearly in the public interest. I'd also be remiss in not thanking from our OSA staff, Andy Showers, Gina Matz, uh, Mohan Samuel, Samuel uh, Burt Marenko, and Alfonso Arnold uh, for their work as well on this case. You know, Commissioner Whitmer mentioned in her statement, uh, today's decision protects and maintains our statutory obligations under Section 1501 of the Public Utility Code, which again requires the Commission to ensure safe and reliable service without unreasonable interruptions or delay. It was uh, maybe misstated here this morning that we're going to abolish consumer protection provisions by agreeing to this decision. Let me reiterate that Section 1501 of the Public Utility Code is still the lay of the land with today's decision. Today's decision also reflects, ladies and gentlemen, the ever-changing marketplace in our telecommunications sector, both in terms of technology deployment and competitive choices for customers. In fact, I think it's today, the FCC is gonna take up a monumental case probably here within the next uh, hour and a half on uh, potentially reclassifying broadband as a public utility service. And I don't wanna get my personal views engaged in that. I will leave that to Chairman Wheeler and the most able-bodied commissioners in the FCC to make that decision. Keep in mind, we don't regulate cable here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So let me go back a little bit. I, I had the opportunity this morning, uh, being a student of history, I asked my staff and Vice Chairman Coleman's staff to get me a copy of the legislative journal of the debate that took place on Chapter 30. And by the way, it was June 24th, 1993. 
And I took interest here this morning at one of the comments, I'll leave the, the member uh, his name out of it, but I'm proud to say he's a state senator now uh, from Philadelphia, so I'll leave it at that. He made a comment in his debate on the floor as we, as the, there was a rigorous debate, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, 22 years ago, debate on this issue. He says, are we prepared for this technology? Are we prepared for this technology? And 22 years later, chapter 40, chapter 40, chapter 30, set forth a regulatory framework whereby ILEX could petition the commission to reduce the traditional monopoly era regulation opposed upon them in Title 66 of the Public Utility Code. So again, two decades later, the legislature approved a process in which we are voting on here today. Our decision today simply recognizes that basic local service in 153 of Verizon's 503 wire centers across this great commonwealth are sufficiently competitive such that reducing, but let me footnote, not eliminating regulatory oversight is deemed appropriate here this morning. By the way, let me give the number again. 153 wire centers, not 194 and not 503, 153. The debate here this morning demonstrates that monopoly telephone service is a dying relic. And let's go back a little bit since we're playing a little history, a revisionist history here. And I asked my staff to pull up some interesting factoids back in 19, in the early 90s. First of all, let's remember, and I was a customer of Suburban Cable, which is now part of Comcast. But back then, cable companies, remember, only offered TV programming. In fact, we all got that box, and you'd have to hit the box and, to get to your channel. And then they were able to kind of make that technology transfer to get the remote to talk to the to the device, and by the way, now I think we can stream things on a, on a uh, smartphone. Wireless was mostly available in major metropolitan areas. In fact, only 10% of the population had a cell phone back in 1995. I think it was the movie Wall Street where Gordon Gecko made the phone so popular. It was about as big as my head. Uh, and now look at the device and what it is today and, and what it provides consumers. And those consumers are on all spectrums of, of, the, uh, of our socioeconomic schedules, from rich to medium income to poor. Everybody has access to a, to a cell phone here in, in the U.S. And most cell phones uh, have incredible functionality from where we started, where you had point-to-point -point calling, and that was basically it. Now it's incorporated uh, 911 and a 911 call center can know where that individual is when they place that call. It's amazing. I remind my kids, no streaming Eagles games on that phone because you'll wipe out the data plan. And by the way, uh, they weren't doing that this year, thankfully. They were, Commissioner Whitmer, they were probably watching Steelers games. But they were smart. They were smart. <laughs> and the way things are going at spring training, they might not be watching uh, Phillies games either. But let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, the World Wide Web in its infancy as we know it, only 15% of the adults of this great nation we live in, only 15% had internet access back in the early 90s. And man, we were really kicking back then. We had warp speeds of 28.8 kilobit dial-up connections, and I remember you had to have your landline phone, and then you had to call Mob Bell, the monopoly telephone company, and get another line attached to your home or business to access this thing known as the internet. Uh, also back in the early 90s, Microsoft introduced Explorer 1.0. Um, the MP3 format was introduced, the first VoIP software was introduced, 32-bit Game Boy was popular. Um, Boris Yeltsin was the leader of the former Soviet Union. The Dow closed at 5,000, and gasoline was a buck ten a gallon. Um, someone wrote in here, Van Halen was still together, but without David Lee Roth, and MTV 
still played music videos. Wow, how things are different today. Customers are actively opting for cable and wireless voice products in large numbers and abandoning Verizon's voice service. After 20 years, and by the way, 22 years in the case of this debate here this morning, after 20 plus years of technology technology improvements and the evolution of a market that has rules around it. There are alternatives that are clearly perceived by customers as a full and complete substitute to the local telephone company's product. I was having a discussion with some fraternity brothers of mine and we were joking about when we lived in a college dormitory at St. Joseph's University, Judge Rainey, right next to Forrest Gumper Elementary School, that I had to call Ma Bell to come out to my dormitory, punch a hole in the wall. And by the way, you were lucky if they came out in a couple weeks to get to you. And uh, you'd pay for that service. If I took you to a college campus today, the majority of those students are using a, P, a, a new device. And to my father and to uh, many senior citizens of this commonwealth, they too are using those devices. It's not for us to socially engineer here today that they're gonna be abandoned by this decision. Going back to what I said earlier, those consumer protections stay on the books. We're not abandoning that. Now is not the time to create hysteria for customers. Now is the time to recognize as a public utility commission, by the way, as we've done to Commissioner Whitmer's point, about competitive electricity choice and gas choice. As we more recently went through this exercise with transportation network companies, you remember that debate and how we had to recognize this new and ever-changing marketplace provided by companies known as Uber and Lyft. By the way, did anybody think back in 1992 there'd be such a, a service known as Uber or Lyft and that consumers, when they got in that vehicle, wouldn't have protections and it would all be a the wild, wild west, well, we didn't, we didn't go there. We made a very clear, very strategic decision. And yes, Commissioner Whitmer, we're waiting on the legislature. As I heard you say at the end, we wanna work with the legislature on this. But no one was abandoned. None of the safeguards were taken away from customers. And that's, again, not what we're trying to do here today. As you heard me say earlier, the petition was for 194 wire centers. We looked and we provide rigorous analysis. I'll debunk the fact that someone, a comment was made, there was no rhyme or reason how we came up with approving the 153. That's just malarkey, we did. We looked at it, we looked at the record, and the record showed very clearly. And I, I was told I couldn't put a map up here today, but I would put a map as an exhibit in this debate here today, that if we just thumbtack those areas, those 153 areas getting approved here today, that there is a competitive option for those customers that wanna cut the cord or wanna go and have a bundle package with the cable company or go somewhere else. There's choice. It's not one choice, it's not two choices. There are many choices to those customers. And again, the consumer protections stay in place for those customers. The vice chairman and I have thoroughly reviewed the record in this case and find that Verizon has demonstrated the availability of at least two independent competitors, one wireless and one and the other being cable. We've agreed with the uh, CWA that cable service should be physically available to owe 97% of the customers before we rule in exchange to be competitive. No one challenged here this morning, you heard it across the board at the bench, no one challenged the ubiquity of wireless service here in the Commonwealth. The areas that we are approving to de-tariff are in the most urban and surrounding areas, the suburban areas of Pennsylvania. And again, I think, I wish I had that exhibit where I could show you the maps and the decision we're making, how strategic it is and how it reflects this competitive landscape that has evolved, ladies and gentlemen, over 22 years, 22 years since the debate took place on the House and Senate floor on June 24th on the approval of Chapter 30. I'm not completely convinced here this morning that 90%, 97% cable deployment, the, the 97%, excuse me, cable requirement that we set forth isn't too high and no carrier's prices 
Uh, no, let it be known that no carrier prices its services based upon an individual's customer circumstances. We're not pricing product here in Pennsylvania as a one-off. And the presence of competition disciplines all service providers, regardless of whether each is a provi provider reaches each and every customer in the wire center. And ladies and gentlemen, let me, let me um, put my um, inner Adam Smith uh, cap on here or feel uh, that I'm... Jan uh, I'm uh, our great uh, Federal Reserve Chairman, Alan Greenspan. The market has evolved over this 22-year period where those technologies have shown up in rural parts of Pennsylvania. I go back to this legislative record where there was a comment made, well, urban centers are going to seek the benefits of this technology. What about the farming community? Um, what about suburban communities across Pennsylvania? And here we are again, 22 years later, where we've got ubiquitous broadband, we've got a wireless network with many providers in the market. And if Verizon wants to price itself out of the market, I'm sure it would be said by Alan Greenspan or any economist at any, any one of our great institutions of higher learning here in Pennsylvania, people will vote with their feet. Nobody gave Verizon the right, if they want to go and raise rates by 50%, that customers are stuck with a 50% rate increase. That is malarkey. These customers will leave. I could go a show of hands here this morning. There is not one of you in this room today that doesn't get an offer in the mail. And God, I, I don't, I mean, Comcast hits us up every week I get an offer. Or from a cell phone provider. Um, we are constantly getting offers, and it's a good thing for customers because some customers, as we learned through electric and gas competition, some people solely focus on price to make that decision. So while we have determined here this morning that 153 wire centers are deemed competitive, uh, we will not be rate, re these, these entities, these 153 areas, will not be rate regulated anymore. And, and this is really the, the, the history lesson that, that we need to share with everybody so we get beyond the, the hyperbole and the scare tactics, that the fact that these 153 areas are deterrent doesn't mean that the consumer protections go away for those customers. And that's, that's I think, very important here the, to mention. I also think it's critically important to mention that the legislature, back on June 24th of 1993, directed the commission to discontinue rate regulation where competition exists, but has made no similar pronouncements in terms of legislation. And I agree with Commissioner Whitmer, if there is an impetus to move a legislative vehicle, we would embrace that. But there's a little bit of hyperbole out there, or misinformation, that we are going beyond our statutory authority in making this approval. That is blatantly wrong. It's misinformed. It's misguided. It is clear in the statute that the companies have the ability to make this petition today. And there is going to be no jeopardy to 911 or low-income customers or service to the elderly. I think that's intellectually dishonest. I think it's, it's a scare tactic, and I think it's uh, that we need to kind of get away from that kind of rhetoric here this morning. The obligation that Verizon continue to be the carrier of last resort, as the vice chairman mentioned in the joint motion, is retained. We give Verizon no, commit, no permission to cease operating its copper network or offering basic local exchange service. The conversion of all networks to fiber may be, uh, is, is certainly continuing to evolve, but it didn't happen at this docket here this morning. In fact, I want to commend, I was driving up, and a great story in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, that Lancaster City has worked not with Verizon, with another provider, on a rollout of a fiber network uh, within its own city boundaries. Again, another success story around chapter 30 and how c consumers here in Pennsylvania, and by the way, this year is the year that we do our final assessment, the 2015 calendar year, 
to really see where we are in having 100% broadband deployment. But it was a testimony to the legislature. It was a testimony to the then governor who had this visionary idea of how Pennsylvania could be a leader. We were an early adopter in what we did with Chapter 30. And then under Governor uh, Ed Rendell, what we were able to do with the next iteration of Chapter 30 was Senate Bill 1000. So this is, again, I, I want to stress to everyone here this morning, this motion strikes the right balance and we look forward to working with the parties to implement this order. Mr. I thank you. And, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I can recognize you, but this is, we're, we're going to, are we going to have a C-SPAN debate or what? what no, no, we? Chairman. After hearing your eloquence, I would like equal time to read all 30 pages of my dissent. <laughs> I'm kidding. Realizing I don't have a flight to catch. <laughs> Uh, but Commissioner Brown, I, I will recognize you before we call the vote. Thank you. And this is not a C-SPAN debate. But I, I found it very interesting that you had a copy of the Legislative Journal, because I, too, had a copy of the Legislative Journal. Um, during February, Black History Month, listening to you and, and listening to what you had to say about this motion, I thought history is very important to the African-American community because most of our history was not written down. It was passed on orally through the family so that people could understand it. So let me pass on some oral history to you as well. Because I know that our legislative journal has small bits and pieces. It has these small statements that members always have a staff person write down. What it does not have is the conversations that took place, whether it's in committee meeting because those conversations are not recorded, or whether it's part of the negotiations because those things are not also part of the record. So the interesting thing about this history of telecommunications is 1993, I was there in the midst of it. In 2004, for the second time that we did Chapter 30, I was also in the midst of it. And the important thing to note that people don't know from reading the journal are the different things and measures that the parties negotiated and talked about. So I think that in reviewing the motion, I was not getting into any type of scare tactics. I didn't accuse all. you of that. Some of your statements or some people were, I'm just letting you know that I was not. I do also want to state that in looking at some of the discussions that we had back in 1993 and in 2004, one of the big issues were issues of affordability. That is still a concern for me. But in terms of the petition that was presenting to us for consideration, and it is within our statutory authority to review it, I know that. I appreciate that. Verizon had every right to introduce this petition to us for consideration. But what they did not do, and what I emphasized in my statement, is that they didn't provide any real evidence to say that there was competition out there. When I look at some of the exchanges or wire centers that they talked about in the evidence that were provided by other parties, in some cases Verizon had 75% or more of the area. Competition, not clearly defined. I've said that before and I will say that again. Competition is not necessarily clearly defined. I know that the General Assembly has not defined it, but those are the concerns that I have placed in my statement, so I want that history to be on the record. Thank you. So noted, I appreciate that. Is there any further comments? We'll note the objections of Commissioner Cauley and Commissioner Brown. The motion passes three to two. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, continuing with the presentation of items from the Commission's carrying agenda, we're now on page two of the carrying agenda. It is recommended that the Commission adopt the staff recommendation with regard to the OSBA's petition for reconsideration in the proceeding involving PPL Electric Utilities Corporation approval of its default service program and procurement plan for the period of uh, June of uh, 2015 through May of 2017, noting the statement of Commissioner Brown. So moved. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Brown for purposes of her statement. Commissioner Brown. Uh, my statement will be submitted for the record. It's clarifying some of the concerns that I had. Um, I will be voting yes on this, but I also expressed some of the same concerns back in the PICO case. So for this purpose, I will be submitting my comments for the record. So noted. Is there any further discussion? Is there any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. 
On behalf of the Law Bureau, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the uh, recommendation with regard to the petition of Cricket Communications, Inc. to relinquish its lifeline only eligible telecommunications carrier designation, noting the statement of Commissioner Brown. So moved. Second. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Brown for purposes of her statement. Commissioner Brown. Uh, in this case, uh, Cricket has provided lifeline to low-income consumers since 2002. After AT&T acquired Cricket in March of 2014, Cricket petitioned the Commission for approval to relinquish its ETC status. The company no longer wishes to be in the lifeline business. AT&T is also transitioning the CDMA technology and architecture that Cricket relied on to an advanced energy uh, and advanced long-term evolution service. LTE allows AT&T to offer more advanced services. If we grant this relinquishment petition, AT&T will no longer have to offer a lifetime discount to low-income consumers who want advanced LTE service. AT&T averts that it has complied with all FCC notice rules, that other ETCs are available, and that its new cricket will not seek ETC designation. However, AT&T points to no ETC carrier that will provide Cricket's current lifelong, lifeline customers with a like or equivalent LTE product on similar terms and conditions, including lifeline discounts. I am concerned that the Cricket's current lifeline consumers may not be able to forego lifeline support, effectively denying them equivalent LTE service. I ask staff to address this equivalency of, ish, of service issue in all future relinquishment petitions. Because of this issue, because this issue was not addressed in this record, I must respectfully dissent on the recommendation to grant this petition. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Any further discussion? Uh, we'll note the objection of Commissioner Brown. The motion passes four to one. And finally, we have the motion of Commissioner Cawley and the proceeding involving the focus management and operations audit of the first energy companies of Pennsylvania. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Cawley for purposes of his motion. Commissioner Cawley. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, at uh, the, the February 12th, uh, 2015 public meeting, the, the Commission released focused management and operations audit of the four first energy companies. As I stated at the time uh, we voted to release that audit, I have very serious concerns with the performance of these companies. This dates, by the way, uh, from the time I rejoined the commission in 2005. The fact that many of our Bureau of Audit's recommendations relate directly to findings in previous audits, premiumly, uh, audits, previous audits findings certainly intensifies my concerns. I note that the companies have in the past indicated acceptance of the majority of the recommendations made by our auditors in these management audits, but evidence evidenced by this current audit, numerous issues have still not been satisfactorily addressed. Accordingly, action must be taken by us to ensure that recommendations that are accepted are in fact carried through and that the underlying issues are rectified in a meaningful way. We have the authority to insist upon this and my proposed action today uh, would bring a particular focus on the recommendations relating to service, reliability, and customer service. Because we have received similar responses to previous audit recommendations with little meaningful improvement, it's imperative that First Energy develop a more robust response to our recommendations. I propose that the companies be directed to provide a more detailed implementation plan <coughs> to provide specific descriptions for investments, process improvements, increased staffing, use of specified technologies, and timelines which will provide binding commitments on the companies 
toward rapid compliance with our reliability and customer service regulations and cure the deficiencies that are ongoing in these companies. The companies should consult with our Bureau of Technical Utility Services, our Bureau of Consumer Services, and our Bureau, Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement so that the implementation plan can address the uh, recommendations that we have made in the most recent <laughs> audit and the ones that, have, that are unfulfilled from previous audits. In particular, uh, the top 10 areas where First Energy is directed to file with us more detailed plans include this list, attainment of reliability benchmarks and standards, worst performing circuits, priority three repairs, damage prevention, new service installations, lack of actual meter readings, overtime and staffing level, level issues, call center issues, residential customer dispute response times, and management performance metrics. It's also imperative that we adopt reporting requirements to ensure progress. And therefore, in addition to submitting a more detailed plan, First Energy is directed for a period of three years to provide additional reports that are listed in the appendix to the motion. Let me be clear, maintaining the status quo is unacceptable. We're tired of the company accepting our management audit recommendations and then not following through, time after time. Failure to file these plans and to correct these performance performance issues in a very timely manner will leave us no choice but to refer the matter to our enforcement lawyers. It's up to them what to do and because of a Pennsylvania Supreme Court case which prohibits the commingling of investigation, prosecution, and decision making, we can't tell our Bureau of Enforcement investigation enforcement what to do, uh, but that's why they are included in the reports that are going to be required of the company, and our enforcement people will see, uh, I think, uh, the correct thing to do from what they see in these reports and how the company responds. I certainly respond, or I, I, re, I expect that First Energy to work with our bureaus as I've suggested, and I strongly urge them uh, this time to come up with the plans and to follow through with them. Therefore, I move that First Energy be directed to file responses to the data requests identified in the motion, that it be directed to file detailed plans within 60 days of the entry of this order, that Law Bureau prepare an order consistent with the motion, and that Law Bureau prepare a tentative order for commission consideration after receiving First Energy, Energy's detailed revised inf implementation plan with recommendations to accept or reject in whole or in part the submitted plan. And finally, that Law Bureau prepare a final order for commission consideration after the receipts or, or receipt of the comments that we may receive as a result of issuing a tentative order. Uh, and uh, after the company files a more detailed revised implementation plan. Thank you, Chairman. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Mr. Chairman, that does conclude the presentation of public meeting reports. Thank you. I want to just report before we gavel out, uh, I want to uh, remind everybody this evening from 4.30 to 7.30, uh, we are going to have our Black History Month reception um, and would encourage everybody to join us over at the State Museum. I'm proud to report again over 21 Commonwealth agencies participating in this evening's event. And um, again, just encourage everybody to join us. It's 4.30 to 7.30 in the State Office Museum. 
Uh, we're going to adjourn, and then I'm going to recognize Commissioner Whitmer.